Hide and Seek. The days Pingu hates most are the days when every young penguin in Antarctica seems to be busy, except Pingu. One such day, Pingu had played with every single one of his toys for at least a few seconds, and now it was time to explore the wide white world outside. There was his sledge. That should be fun for a lot of seconds, perhaps even a minute. Pingu pushed himself across the snow until he came to his favourite place of icy rocks and pillars of snow. There was usually fun to be had round here, so Pingu and his sledge went exploring. But amongst all those rocks and pillars, they found nothing. Then, from behind a snowy rock, Pingu heard a sound. He knew that laugh. It was Seymour, the baby seal. Seymour flapped round the rock to Pingu, and they hugged each other. <laughs> now there'd be fun. <gasps> Seymour sat at the front of the sledge, and Pingu pushed them along with his feet. Until... <sighs> Pingu spotted a group of ruined ice and snow igloos, and amongst them, piles of old abandoned wooden barrels. Now, Pingu and Seymour had had fun with barrels before, so they hurried over. Together, they raced round and round the first ruined igloo. But soon, Pingu was racing on his own. Where was Seymour? Well, the baby seal had cunningly hidden himself inside the ruined igloo. And when Pingu raced past a window, Seymour leapt out. <laughs> Seymour thought it was brilliant. <laughs> Pingu didn't. Until, of course, he thought of hiding himself and leaping out when Seymour flapped past. <laughs> Pingu thought it was brilliant and celebrated by dancing his famous penguin frightening dance. Then he rushed off among the other igloos while Seymour tried to keep up with him. <laughs> After a few moments of rushing, Pingu realised that Seymour had vanished again. Where was he now? Pingu was giving his head a good scratch when Seymour splatted Pingu with a snowball. <laughs> Already, Pingu was making his own snowball. He hurled it at Seymour. Too late. Seymour had ducked out of sight. But Pingu was after him. He chased the baby seal all around the ruined igloos until Seymour vanished yet again. Pingu feared the worst. Oh! Yes, Seymour was ready with another snowball. Ha! Missed, he thought. And Pingu quickly made a snowball himself. He hurled it over his wall towards Seymour, who was hiding behind another wall, ready to fire his own snowball. Missed again. But this was now a battle. After some time, Pingu still hadn't managed to hit Seymour, and Seymour teased Pingu. <coughs> Pingu wasn't having that, but what he did have was a plan. Behind his wall, he'd spotted some black, squashy, rubbery blubber. He rolled it, bashed it and squeezed it, until it was round, like a head. With some ice and a pair of pebbles, Pingu made eyes for the head. And with a handy lump of orange stone, he made a beak. Yes, Pingu had made a clever model of his own head. He stuck the model penguin head on a long stick and pushed it above the top of his wall. And Seymour was fooled. When Pingu had carefully made the biggest snowball of the day, he crept from behind his wall, leaving the model head poking above it. Seymour hurled his giant snowball and it splattered into the model head, which collapsed in a small heap onto the snow. Seymour hurried across to the collapsed head as Pingu hurried towards the pile of barrels. When Seymour saw his snowball had just hit some squashy old blubber, he was fed up. But now Pingu was on the march, with a barrel right over his head and just his feet sticking out. 
Seymour called to Pingu, who marched nearer, still hidden in the barrel. As Seymour peered all round, Pingu launched the mightiest snowball yet. It landed right beside Seymour's head. Wherever Seymour looked, he just couldn't see Pingu, who was, of course, still hidden inside his barrel. At last, Seymour spotted the penguin in the barrel. He chased him in and out of the ruined igloos. Until Pingu tripped and tumbled out of his barrel. Then Seymour toppled head over heels over another barrel. This time he really had hurt himself. Pingu hurried to the baby seal and tried to cheer him up. By standing on his head, sticking his head between his legs, and turning head over heels backwards. <laughs> that almost worked. Seymour almost smiled. So Pingu leapt inside a barrel and lifted off the metal hoop that held it together. He put the hoop round his middle and began to dance his famous penguin hula hoop dance. <laughs> At last, Seymour laughed again. And so finally, Pingu was even busier than any other young penguin in Antarctica. School time. The life of a young penguin in the cold climes of Antarctica isn't all fun and games and getting into trouble. Sometimes even Pingu has to go to school. One morning, after eating up all his fish crispies, Pingu set out with his satchel on his back. He hadn't gone far when he heard a familiar sound. It was Seymour, the baby seal. He came rushing up to Pingu and flapped along with him until they came to the top of Slithering Slope. Seymour wanted to have the first slither and down he went. Pingu took the satchel off his back, dropped it on the hard packed snow and lay down on top. He'd made himself a satchel sledge. And he too had a great slide down Slithering Slope. <laughs> Pingu and Seymour soon arrived at Mr Pengchip's school for infant penguins. A row of snow desks and snow stools stood side by side on the ice in front of an enormous blackboard. Suddenly, the door of Mr Pengchip's study opened and out came the teacher himself. It was time for Seymour to leave and he dived neatly into the icy water of the school fishing hole. Mr Pengchips rang the school bell and Pingu's two friends, Pengru and Pengwood, hurried across the ice to their snow desks. Mr Pengchips greeted his class. <laughs> Who would be star pupil today? The first lesson was to be things to eat that you find in a fishing hole. Mr. Pengchips picked Pengru from the class and sent him to the school fishing hole. Pengru took a deep breath and dived into the icy water. Moments later, Pengru leapt from the fishing hole and told Mr. Pengchips what he'd seen down there. He was asked to draw on the blackboard a picture of what he'd seen. It was a haddock. Penguin volunteered to go next, and he too dived into the fishing hole. <laughs> Moments later, Penguin leapt out again and described what he'd seen down there. And Mr. Pengchips asked Penguin to draw on the blackboard a picture of what he'd seen. <laughs> It was the skeleton of a haddock, announced Penguin. 
Mr. Pengchips wasn't too pleased. Not even penguins can eat fish bones, he explained. So it's a waste of time even looking for them. Now Pingu had an idea. He said he could draw what was in the fishing hole without even going to look. But the others didn't believe him. Pingu then barked like a baby seal and flapped about on the ice just like Seymour. Mr. Pengchips and his pupils wanted to know what an ice Pingu was meant to be. So Pingu went up to the blackboard and drew a picture of a baby seal. But nobody believed he'd see a baby seal in the school fishing hole. Pingu took a fish he'd been saving, a mullet actually, from under his snow desk and held it over the fishing hole. Up leapt Seymour. And with one bite, reduced Pingu's mullet to a skeleton. Then Seymour slipped back into the icy water. Mr. Pengchips and his pupils were impressed. They wanted to meet Seymour. Pingu called his friend, and the baby seal leapt from the fishing hole into the school. Mr. Pengchips asked Seymour to help with the lesson. Seymour dived into the water and reappeared with a haddock in his mouth. Mr. Pengchips displayed the haddock on his blackboard. No sooner had he hung the haddock than Seymour popped up from the hole with a long, wriggly eel. As Mr. Pengchips hung up the eel, Seymour produced a flatfish that looked just like an omelette with a tail and fins. This was a place. Seymour disappeared again and this time returned with a lobster. Soon the lobster joined the other sea creatures hanging from Mr. Pengchips' blackboard. The teacher asked his pupils to name the creatures. Peng would recognise the haddock and then Mr. Pengchips pointed to the eel. When Peng would got that right too, Mr. Pengchips pointed to the next fish. Peng knew that one, but Peng wasn't too sure. Then he remembered. It was a place. Now Mr. Pengchips called on Pingu to name the final creature. The others knew it was a lobster, but Pingu wasn't too sure. Seymour wasn't going to let his friend look silly, and while Mr. Pengchips' back was turned, he scribbled the penguin word for lobster onto the board. As soon as Pingu said the word, Seymour rubbed it out again. But Mr. Pengchips was pleased. Today, all his penguin infants really were star pupils. Pingu and the Barrel Organ <laughs> Have you ever seen a barrel organ? It's a rather large, unusual sort of instrument which plays tunes when you wind rolls of music through it. Far away, among the snows of Antarctica, an elderly penguin, old Mr. Penghoven, was playing his barrel organ, hoping that a passing penguin would throw money into the hat he'd laid on the ground. Pingu heard the music and came to see what was going on. He'd never seen a barrel organ before and he loved it. He burrowed amongst his tail feathers and pulled out a shiny coin. He dropped it into old Mr. Penghoven's hat. The old barrel organist was most grateful. Pingu wanted to help the old penguin, and when he saw another penguin strolling along, he asked him to thank Mr. Penghoven for his beautiful music by giving him some money. But to Pingu's annoyance, the grumpy penguin just turned his back and hurried away. Pingu searched all through his own feathers, but he'd got no more money to give. Old Mr. Penghoven told him not to worry. But when Pingu has decided to help, he helps. A tall, smart penguin came along now, and Pingu tried to interest him in the barrel organ. But the smart penguin just hurried past. Pingu was cross and raced after him. 
he jumped in front of the smart penguin and tried to stop him. But the smart penguin just pushed him aside. Pingu fell back into the snow. And the smart penguin hopped neatly over him. Pingu said exactly what he thought of smart penguins. But next, a much kinder penguin strolled across the ice. And when Pingu asked if he would help Mr Penguin. My kind of matter of fact, very delicious. The kind penguin handed him a small but tasty fish. Pingu was thrilled and hurried back to Mr Penghoven, who was tired now and taking a rest. Pingu handed him the fish. The old greying barrel organist was grateful for the kind penguin's fish and soon gobbled it all up. He was so touched, he let Pingu have a go on his barrel organ. When a wealthy-looking penguin walked by, Pingu called out to him. But the wealthy penguin wasn't interested in barrel organs. Pingu suddenly looked up into the sky, pretending he'd seen something fascinating. As the wealthy penguin strutted off, he looked up too, and not looking where he was going, stepped straight into a fishing hole. And it served him right. Mr Penghoven felt it was time to go home, and Pingu helped by sliding the barrel organ on its runners across the ice. Soon they arrived at an ancient tumble-down igloo which had holes all over it. This was poor old Mr Penghoven's ice and snow shack. Inside, there were only a few tattered old boxes and Mr Penghoven's tattered old armchair. Pingu felt sad. He offered to go shopping for Mr Penghoven, who was far too tired to go himself. Pingu took the barrel organ and pushed it first to Mother Pengpride's bakery. He played a tune outside. Now, Mother Pengpride loved barrel organs and gave Pingu free bread and rolls. Pingu then went on to Miss Peng and Decker's hardware store. Miss Peng and Decker also loved barrel organs. She gave Pingu a warm rug for Mr. Penghoven and some useful cleaning materials. On Pingu went again to the shop where Mr. Penganade sold bottles and bottles of delicious drinks. He loved barrel organs too and gave Pingu a pair of his best bottled drinks. Pingu went on to Mr. Pengatel's store with its fine, fresh fish. Mr. Pengatel was delighted to give Pingu some fine, fresh fish free. And on Pingu went again, this time back to old Mr. Penghoven's tumble-down home. He slid the barrel organ with its food and drink into the igloo. Oh, Mr. Penghoven was thrilled with what Pingu had brought him. Pingu laid a table and set out one of Mr. Pengatel's fine fresh fish with some of Mother Pengpride's best bread rolls. While the elderly penguin tucked into his meal, Pingu set about blocking up some of the holes in the igloo with planks of wood. Then he made huge snowballs and hurled them at the holes that were too high to reach. At his table, Mr. Penghoven soon finished his fish and rolls and drained a glass of Mr. Penganade's delicious drink. Pingu was throwing logs onto the crackling fire in the stove when he heard a remarkable sound. I bet you have fallen Mr. Penghoven had taken his old mouth organ from under his armchair and he was so grateful for Pingu's kindness he made him a present of the mouth organ. Mr. Penghoven bye, bye, waved bye, his bye, new bye. friend goodbye. Bye, bye. Pingu left for his own ice and snow home. Bye, bye. As he walked along, his heart filled with the good deeds he'd done 
Pingu discovered something wonderful. He was, without a single lesson, a brilliant mouth organist. Pingu's Ice Cave Papa is a handy penguin about the house. He can cook, he can clean, and this particular morning he was doing the family ironing. About a garden or a bed, yes. Mm -hmm. He enjoyed his ironing, but always remembered to take an interest in how well young Pingu was doing at learning to write. Pingu had just finished a page of lettering and showed it to Mama, who was sitting next to him at the table. Mm -hmm. Mama was pleased with his work until she noticed a great inky blot all over one corner of the paper. She was telling Pingu to write the page all over again when there was a knock at the door. The door opened and in came Pingu's penguin pal, Pengru. He wanted Pingu to come out and play with his brand new bouncy rubber ball. All thoughts of writing flew from Pingu's head and he begged Mama to let him play. Mama asked Papa, who knew there was no point in arguing. Mm -hmm. Pingu leapt from his chair and dashed from the house with Pengu. Out in the ice and snow, Pengu tried out his bouncy ball on his head and then tossed it to Pingu. Of course, Pingu just had to show off. He kicked the ball backwards over his head and it bounced away across the snow, followed by Pingu and Pengru. It rolled to a halt under a shelf of ice. But when Pengru went to fetch the bouncy ball, suddenly a slab of ice shifted beneath his feet and he dashed back to safety. Pingu was a lot smaller, so now he carefully tiptoed across the ice. He'd nearly reached the ball, when suddenly the slab of ice shifted beneath his feet. Pengru would have to help him. Pengru sat nervously down on the other end of the slab of ice and tried to balance it. As Pingu reached out for the bouncy ball, Pengru made his big mistake. He stood up again and moved nearer to Pingu. Now the ice gave way beneath them both and the two young penguins were sliding at high speed down a dangerous slope of ice until they found themselves in a cave of ice far below. Pengu looked all around while Pingu sat down and cried. Pengu thought they should try to struggle back up the dangerous slope of ice. But from above came a crash. Tons of snow were falling and the hole the young penguins had fallen through was blocked. They were trapped in the ice cave. Now Pengu sat down and cried. Pingu realised they'd have to explore the mysterious gleaming white cave, but first they should find out if there was anyone else down there. No, no. no reply. So on through the cave they went. With its weird columns of ice hanging from the roof and its strange icy shapes clinging to the walls and floor. Bingo! Carefully they made their way along narrow ice ledges. <laughs> Past mighty chasms. <laughs> and through tiny passages until Pingu came upon a pile of abandoned miners' tools. And beyond was a steep path of ice leading to light above. But Pengru had spotted that the road ahead had given way. The path seemed suddenly to end in a sheer drop to who knows what below. But Pingu wouldn't give up. There was a miner's rope hanging from a peg in the ice wall high above. 
he would swing across the chasm below to the path he could see on the other side. <laughs> he landed safely on the far side. But his swing had been too much for the peg. The rope came away from the wall. How was Pengru to get across? But still, Pingu wouldn't give up. He made a loop in the end of the rope and flung it across the chasm towards Pengru. The loop fell neatly over a column of ice. On his side of the chasm, Pingu stretched the rope tightly around another column. Now, Pengru would be able to cross the rope wing over wing. Pengu was scared, but he took hold of the rope and launched himself into mid-air. Inch by inch, he struggled along the rope. But Pingu kept it tight. And Pengu made it across. Now they had to struggle up the steep path of ice ahead. Pingu went first and with a mighty effort reached the top. Pengu followed on wings and knees and joined Pingu. Above was a rickety wooden trap door. With a heave, they pushed it aside and helped each other from the ice cave onto the safe snowy ground above. That, thought Pingu, is enough adventure for one day. Pingu plays fish tennis. <laughs> Whenever Seymour, the baby seal, leaves the icy waters of the Antarctic, he's out for fun and games. So, the morning he found his penguin pal Pingu snoozing outside his ice and snow house, he was pretty fed up. But at last, Pingu woke up. And Seymour thought he'd start the fun and games with a snowball. It whizzed past Pingu and squelched onto the wall beside him. Pingu jumped. He looked around, but all he could see was the snowman who often stood outside his ice and snow house. The snowman seemed to call to Pingu. But snowmen can't call, and they can't move, and they certainly can't throw snowballs. Pingu peered all about, but again, the snowman seemed to call him. Then Seymour appeared from behind the snowman and hurled another snowball at Pingu. Pingu was now rather cross and marched across the snow towards the baby seal, who dashed back behind the snowman, and then popped out again, carrying a great big floppy fish, which he slid across the snow at Pingu. Pingu fell splat over the slithering floppy fish. He wobbled back and forth on his tummy like a feathery seesaw. But then Seymour helped Pingu back onto his flippers, and at last Pingu began to see the joke. Now then, thought the two friends, what games could we play with this great big floppy fish? Pingu was really impressed when Seymour balanced the fish on his nose. He was like a juggler in an ice circus. Then Seymour flipped the floppy fish to Pingu, who dropped it. When Pingu tried to pick up the slippery fish in his penguin wings, it shot away across the ice. Pingu hurried after the fish and tried to pick it up again. But again the fish shot away from him. Seymour thought this was a great laugh, but Pingu didn't. He'd had enough of these fishy antics, so he dived on the great floppy nuisance and this time scooped it up in his wings. Then he hurled it at Seymour, who caught it neatly on the end of his nose and bounced it up and down, just as though it were a rubber ball. Then he slid across the snow, still bouncing the fish on his nose. What a show-off! But now it was Pingu's turn to show off. He balanced the ball on top of his head and danced his famous penguin balancing dance. Then he flung the fish high into the air. It flew higher and higher and then flopped head down, mouth open, splat over Pingu's head. Pingu looked like a penguin in a fish turban. So now he did his famous penguin turban dance. 
Now Seymour was really impressed. But Pingu had had quite enough, thank you very much, so he made Seymour pull the fish off. By the time Pingu had checked his head hadn't been pulled off as well, Seymour was playing with the fish on the far side of Pingu's mama's washing line. Pingu hurried to join him. He wanted to go with the fish. Seymour threw it to him across the washing line. Pingu threw the fish back to Seymour and in no time they found themselves playing a thrilling game of fish tennis. Towards the end of the first set, Pingu tried a different way of playing. He squeezed the fish between his wings and sort of squirted it over the washing line. Seymour bounced the fish back to Pingu. Pingu caught the fish again and again squirted it over the line. Seymour bounced the fish back to Pingu, who caught it and again squirted it. But this time, the fish didn't fly over the washing line. It flopped onto the line and just sort of hung there. Pingu and Seymour were furious. Seymour leapt up and down, but he just couldn't reach that fish and he got crosser and crosser. Pingu tried climbing the pole at the end of the line. But then he remembered that penguins can't climb, so he had to slide back to the bottom of the pole. But now he had a better idea. He hurried back to his own house. Where he found his own special pair of Antarctic stilts. Then he leapt up onto them. In no time, Pingu was back at the washing line. High up now, he was able to ping the fish off the line. And Seymour was able to catch it. Time for lunch, he thought. Instantly, the floppy fish became their meal. And together, Pingu and Seymour tucked into their lunch. Soon they were full and ready again for fun and games. And what could be more fun for a young penguin than spending all afternoon marching about Antarctica on his Antarctic stilts? And what could be more fun for a baby seal than spending all afternoon chasing a penguin on stilts? <laughs>